We'll decide what that's going to be. Yeah, we'll take both. On walk we probably song. don't even need these, but let's see if we can get them to work. Um, yeah. How's that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I don't know. We've done karaoke together before, so it's <laughs> dangerous. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome to our Sign Institute event where we are celebrating somebody who I know very well, Catherine Miller who is a good friend and is a good friend of Sign and American University. Um, Catherine wrote a book, that's why you're here. Um, and she wrote At the Table recently, and it's, it's an incredible book that we're gonna really get into. We're gonna talk for a little while and I want you guys to start thinking up your questions because we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions. This is your event. But I don't know if you know this, Catherine, but next year, it's our 25 year anniversary of meeting each other. Did you know that? Oh, God. <laughs> that makes me feel very old. 20, 25, well, 25 we years. met in the hospital. <laughs> um, but we met 25 years ago, yeah. working in politics, working in advocacy, and no gifts. We don't have to do gifts next year. But you have been a gift to sign because- How about the re-election of Joe Biden? <laughs> How about that? Okay, Isn't let's it? get political. I knew <laughs> she would. Um, no, but it's incredible that while you were at the James Beard Foundation- um, you uh, agreed to be a Sign Institute Fellow for us, and we want to welcome you back to AU, and thank you so much for being here. Thank no. you. Um, thanks for having me, um, and thanks for filling in for Karen, who has COVID. That's what I was going to say. Poor Karen. COVID still exists. Karen is not with us tonight because we got a... And then it was like, should we wait every hour and test every hour? And we're like, Karen, why don't you go take care of yourself? She's a really good friend and advocate um, and somebody that you know well. And so she sends her best to everybody. She's a good friend at AU's too. So we'll have her back soon on campus. Um, Catherine, it's so incredible. I have read the book. I read the book when I had to print it out and like before it was even hot off the presses. But we're so grateful that you um, did the work that you did when you were here at AU, but you wrote this book about truly about advocacy using food policy as an example. But when I think of your career, whether you were at the UN Foundation or whether you were at uh, the DCCC or whether you know you were living in Australia working you know for PR firms and, and whatnot, advocacy has always been a part of the conversation. And I think it's so incredible to have a conversation tonight about like issues that you care about. How do you get in Engaged, how do you get to do the work that you want to do? So you've had so many careers in many sectors, including democratic politics, but um, can you tell us a little bit about the journey and how it informs your views on advocacy? Almost like, how did we get here? Yeah, um, it's such a great question. I mean, I don't think my career made much sense to anybody but me, you know, much to my mother's chagrin and others um, were kind of like, what is she doing? But it's a sort of a, it's a career in thirds, right? A third um, learning about our electoral system and working in hardcore democratic politics and for the Democratic Party. And then taking those lessons into the world of corporates and social responsibility and large scale campaign engagement. And I remember when somebody was like, you know, my first political boss gave me my first break in the corporate world. And she was like, you've got to come do this because all this stuff translates. Right, all the stuff that we learn about how to um, form plans and strategies and communicate and how we think about milestones and campaigns have end goals and all those things all translate to the corporate world. So we went there and then I hated the corporate world. <laughs> it's not my place. Um, and moved into the world of social impact for foundations and nonprofits. And there you could see all of these practices at a sort of global scale, right? That you could apply all the things that I had learned working on a Senate race in South Dakota to figuring out how to mobilize hundreds of millions of dollars to sell bed nets um, in support of malaria eradication in on the continent of Africa. 
And then I was doing these trainings and I was doing this stuff and I, and I love teaching and I love working with folks and, um, and the James Beard Foundation, uh, two trustees came to me and said, do you want to do this thing that we want to do, which was to train chefs to be advocates. And I just thought that was the stupidest freaking thing I'd ever That's heard. So funny. I read that in the book and I'm like, mm, she's like, chefs can't do this. Is, this is crazy. So originally the concept was no, this is not going to work. No, I mean, for me, it wasn't going to work, right? Because it was this idea that, um, you know, and we really focused on it probably too much at the beginning, which was celebrity, right? And I had a little bit of a celebrity hangover, like working in sort of global campaigns and causes, because we'd go out and we'd find a celebrity to be David Beckham to do a, throw a to kick a soccer ball into a soccer net for malaria, right? Or Lady Gaga to tweet about the tsunami in J Japan. But what we were learning was none of those things were actually translating to votes or real dollars because their audiences weren't really interested in that, right? Like they were. You had to make that connection, and it wasn't to make that connection. And so when I was thinking about, you know, so when they came to me about this idea about celebrity chefs, I was like what is their connection to any of this, right? They feed us or they're, and I, and, you know, I am a shallow person, it turns out, because um, <laughs> they came back a couple of times and they kept asking me to do it. And I kept saying no and no and no. And then they came back and they said, well, let me tell you, it's at this um, resort called Blackberry Farm, which is like this ridiculous five-star resort. It's like the best place. Like, well, let's give them a chance. Sure. Let's give them a chance. Right. It turns out I'm very shallow. Um, and, that, you know, and I remember even on the plane to the first Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and change, I stopped, I'm a huge connoisseur of um, pop culture, right? Like I, I live for like, give me an Us Weekly of people, give me all the things, right? And so I had collected this stack of magazines and on the way to Blackberry Farm in July of 2012, every single magazine had a story about a chef by the name of Sean Brock. And Sean was the chef at um, a place called Husk in Charleston. He has the most beautiful tattoos. And so his tattoos were in vogue. His recipes were in real simple or right. Um, his, there was a story about his work um, preserving, um, bringing back a certain varietal of corn was in time. Like every single magazine that I had with me on that trip. And then I walk out into the beautiful world of Blackberry Farm and there is Sean Brock. Because the other thing I don't really do is I don't really prepare, <laughs> right, for these things. And so, like, I never really want to know who the, I don't want to get too deep into the people I'm training. Like, and so I don't do a lot of Googling and that kind of stuff. And there was Sean. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. And then throughout the course of the, that weekend, the penny sort of dropped for me about it. And I was like, and it totally changed my life. And it changed everything about like my career and my life. And um, and it's just so meaningful because it was also centered in food. Well, we were so fortunate when you were here, you did bring some of those celebrity chefs and you brought Tom Colicchio and you brought Andrew Zimmer. And the point being that they cared about policy. And Tom was one of the first ones who cared about the policy part of it, right? So how how did you help chefs make that connection? And what was the point where they started to, well, I care about these issues, but I want to engage, or did you have to tell them you, you care about these issues, you need to engage? No, I think, I mean, I think the chefs we started working with are, are all at a certain point in their career, right? Um, so they were thinking about what they were going to do outside of the kitchen, or they were being asked to do things outside of the kitchen, outside of their kitchens. But it really came down to, I mean, food is the most central thing to all of our lives, right? If you don't have it, you will starve. If you eat the wrong food for you or too much of it, you might die, right? It impacts your health, it impacts our local economies. It's all of our flavor memories, right? Like it is, and, uh, and a lot of our personal memories. And so this idea that chefs could do it in three places, right? So they could influence all of our choices on the plate, right? then they are in every single city across the world, right? Everybody has a favorite local restaurant, right? It may not be a Michelin star restaurant, it may not, be, but everybody has one, right? And then if you could make the connection between those two things in their brain, 
they could think about lasting change. And that's really like, I'm a policy wonk and a geek too. So like, I think that policy, who controls power controls policy and policy controls our lives. And that's for every issue and every you have issue. to be with these chefs. What, what were the, let's get tactical. Like what was the A for, I think you said A for advocacy is like, we're sitting at this farm. You're like, hey, I'm here. This guy was in Us Weekly. Like, but like <laughs> what, what happened? What was the process to help them figure it out? Yeah, so it, it, it would look like any, anybody, anybody here done trainings, advocacies, like, you know, message training, right? It looks like trainings we're all super familiar with, right? Like you're around a room and you do the presentation and you walk them through things. And what, and what crystallized a couple of trainings afterwards was they started to connect to the idea that chefs, one, control our culture, right? We all eat kale for a reason, right? Goat cheese, right? We really do, right? Like it is um, Alice Waters single-handedly invented, it reinvigorated the American goat cheese industry, like literally single-handedly, right? Um, and so we all, it, it's it's there. And I just totally lost my train of thought. So you're going to have to help me get back. Because you were on Blackberry Farm and you were teaching Blackberry them. Farm. Right? No. And so like, we're teaching them. And so one is like the culture. The two is trust. Right? The three, you know, the third is like all this influence, their networks, that bit of celebrity. And they... Um, so they had it all. And Chef Maria Hines, who was one of the original um, boot camp alums and went on to help me co-found and be the founding co-director of the Chef Action Network, was like, Catherine, everything, it's, it's a mise en place, right? Which is a chef term of like, you have everything. Who are like, like cooks here? Do they, do cooks? you know what that is? Yeah, yeah mise en place is, yeah, right? Right, so it's a mise en place. We have all these things in place. And then you teach them the tools, right? How to create a succinct message, how to find, figure out who your audience is, how to figure out how to open a conversation with someone without arguing with somebody, right? How to figure out who the people that you need are next to them. So a couple, like two boot camps later, somebody, um, I was sitting in a coffee shop with somebody and I was like telling them this story about the training and they're like, oh, this is A is for advocacy. You just find an A for every single piece of it, right? So like alliteration helps. <laughs> Um, and it helps stick it in the chef mind too, right? Because this is not what they do every day. Well, and one of the things I liked about the book, which now seems obvious to me, and especially working in politics, but A is for access too, right? So they are in their communities and who's having dinner at their restaurant? Yes. But their congressman, their mayor, their... So suddenly they realize that they can have a conversation and what, I forget which chef was like the one who was like uh, worked with... Um, uh, Republican yes, uh, somebody who they thought that, oh, he's coming in, he ordered and he's at this table, but never made the connection like, wait, while he's here, I can talk to him about what I'm concerned about. So tell a little bit about that story, because I like yeah. that. So one of the things about advocacy, and I love that I'm adding that A is for access. That didn't occur to me till just now. Very nice, Amy Dacey. Um, but, uh, you know, A is for Amy. Too. A is for Amy. <laughs> Um, but like we're, we are lucky, right? Like we live in Washington, DC, right? And so we see presidents, congressmen, the mayor, like they're just kind of normal people to us. And, um, but they're the same when they're in a restaurant, right? Because everybody eats, everybody needs to do a fundraiser. Everybody has a thing, right? So, um, people, we do this thing at, at the, when I would ask people, I'm like, just raise your hand if a member of Congress has ever come into your restaurant. And without fail, every single chef hand would go up. Who's had a governor? They stay up, right? Who's had a presidential candidate? They stay up, right? Because these are the places we host fundraisers. These are the places that, and, but one of the things that we're always looking for in advocacy is how do we have this moment that creates a personal connection and a relationship? And one of the things that chefs have that we don't always have, right, is the ability to not go up and confront someone at their table while they're having dinner, but be like, hey, do you want to tour the kitchen? You want to meet my staff? Great. Who doesn't love that? Right. Like really humanizing the issue. Humanizing and just like making that connection. Right. And then you can walk and talk and and so Joy Crump is a chef um, in Virginia. She's an African-American black, she's a black woman chef. She was on Top Chef. She's a, one of these celebrities. She's an amazing role model. And she, her Republican congressman eats at her restaurant all the time. And Joy is an advocate for community gardens. She's an advocate for, you know, um, funding for school meals. Like 
she was not thinking that this person was somebody that she was going to have anything to talk to about, right? And but it turns out he's a he's a second he's a multi generational tomato farmer, right? Um, he is in this rural district. He's in this community. So Joy, you know, was like, "Hey, do you want to see my kitchen?" And then, "Hey, do you want to meet my farmers?" Hey, do you want to meet the community garden where that comes from? And over a period of months that turned into years, right? She grew, developed a relationship with him. And that made the negotiations over SNAP and other things during the 2018 Farm Bill, like at least doable and a conversation, right? Because it was just really helpful to humanize it, to create that personal relationship and to create it in the form of a conversation. Well, it's interesting that they they open up these conversations. Let's go back a little bit to the policy part of it, because this is something that you found a passion for. And, you know, it's it's we can advocate for a lot of different issues, but this is the one that you really came to. Um, you say our food choices impact everything from our personal health to the preservation of our planet, all by the choices we make with food. Some parts of the book, and I'm not going to tell you all because you have to buy one, you have to read it, but... <laughs> Let's just talk about how it's naive not to think that every single food decision made affects us in some way. Can you, if you I don't know if you remember my memory, but like even when you walk through the FDA and what choices are made, oh yeah, you know that was interesting to me. So yeah, uh, you know, I, I, there's a couple of things. I think the most so far, the best in some ways review that I've gotten was from my 18 year old niece Gracie, who was like, oh my gosh you taught me that it was a system, right? That, yeah. Um, she's like, I read this chapter and I understood all of the things now about food, right? About how it's important to think about how it's grown. It's important to think about, you know, it's nutritional piece. It's important to think about flavor, but then it's also important to think about all the things that go into producing that food, right? And so when we think about something like the FDA, um, there's a piece in the book that looks at eggs, right? And there are regulations focusing on how the chickens are raised. There are regulations on how the eggs are taken and stored. There's a regulation about what's inside the egg and what's outside the egg, right? The, the safety of it, right? And then there are marketing dollars that USDA and FDA spend to market eggs to us, right? So there are a myriad of politics, policies and practices and regulations that go into literally everything that we eat, right? And so one of the other things about chefs is that they're incredibly great. They're incredible storytellers. So they can take the super complicated thing, right? Like I find the food system overwhelming. And often when I'm standing in the grocery store, I'm like, what, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm like everybody else, but I often will hear them in my head talk to me about why that fish, not that fish, or why the, if you're going to eat meat, you should eat this type of meat, right? Like those those types of things. And so they're really good translators at a hugely complex um, system. And, and it's interesting too, because you and I have talked a lot and you, you mentioned a lot when we were um, working together at the at the Institute that when we hear farm bill, we think, oh yeah, that's something over there. It's something, the farm bill touches every part of our food lives and the parts that we don't even realize, right? Yeah. So how one piece of legislation that we assume is for someone else actually matters to us individually. Yeah, and it's the only comprehensive food bill that we have as Americans, literally. Like it is, you know, there are lots of other bills that, you know, but everything gets rolled up into the farm bill in terms of the authorization and then the subsequent appropriation for money related to our food system, right? And what drives me nuts about that um, is that how much of that subsidy and how much of that money deprioritizes our communities, our health and deliciousness, right? Like I don't want to eat fields and fields of grapeseed oil, <laughs> right? Like, um, and so, it, you know, there is this thing that we, it's, it, again, it's super complex and it's um, really dense and it's a little scary, but if you pay attention to any one thing, you should pay attention to the farm. <laughs> because it was so inclusive that it, it was, uh, for me, it was overwhelming a bit. Um, but then we, 
also look at this. So there's the policy, there's how our food's produced, it's how our food is regulated. It is, but this is a workforce, ec local development, economic issue, right? So how is food an economic issue and why should we care about it from that aspect? Yeah. So in the US, you know, the food, the food economy, so most um, I'm going to get my stats sort of, I'll keep them vague so I won't get them entirely wrong, right? But, you know, we as Americans spend about 50% of our disposable income on food. 50%. 50%, right? Um, and that could be food in a restaurant. It could be food in our homes, right? So think about all the people that are then employed to create that food, to produce that food, to pick that food, right? Um, in the restaurant industry, pre-COVID, there were about 11 million restaurant workers. Anybody here was a restaurant their first job, right? It was a really bad waitress and I don't ever want to do it again, right? Um, a, a really bad server, but you know, that is- What was the name of that restaurant? So my family owned a restaurant in Florida for about 25 years. It was called the Old Post Office in my um, original hometown of Niceville, Florida. Yeah. Such a fitting name for a restaurant. And right. yes, yeah. and the it was a family office. business. And family business. And I was a really bad waitress. Um, but, you know, so, you know, one, it's the jobs that the food system creates. It's the taxes that they pay. It's the circular economy that it creates, maintains, and grows. Right. Um, and what we don't appreciate fully is all the hidden costs of that food system. Right. So our, our food is artificially cheap and subsidized by the farm bill and the prices are kept at a certain pace. And yet our health care goes up. The cost of the environmental degradation goes up. Right. And so we are spending about, let's say, about a trillion dollars on food. And food is actually costing us about three trillion dollars. Right. And so if we redirect those subsidies, right, if we start prioritizing fruits, whole fruits and vegetables, if we start prioritizing um, local regional farm systems um, and not large monoculture farms, all of those things we can actually produce food that is better for us and better for the planet and still delicious. And I always I, is the, I always stress the delicious piece because no one wants to eat something that doesn't taste good, right? <laughs> there's too much good out there. There's too much good out there. So, um, and I know there's a question on that for you personally, but we'll save that for the audience questions. Um, so there's this aspect about, you know, production and, you know, regulation of eggs. And then we've got this whole as consumers, like the price, but then this is an industry that employs millions and millions and millions of people in this yeah. country. So there's also issues around economic factors that are at play. And, and this is another connect to those local elected officials to say, you know, this yeah, is another I mean, big aspect of it. The restaurants and farm workers are still the only workers in the United States who you are legally able to pay a sub-minimum wage to, right? So we think about it, and literally, they're the only two classes of employees that you can do that, right? And that you are legally able to pay two thirty. If I'm looking at like two thirty-five, two. I'm looking at Ted. He's my um, USDA person, right? Um, and we haven't had a meaningful federal minimum wage increase, right, since 2007. I think was the last one, and before that, it had been the 1990s, right? So these are the people who produce our food. These are the people who service our food. These are the people who clean up after us in restaurants, right? And you know, we should be protecting their safety. We should be paying them a wage that they can live and participate meaningfully in economy. And, you know, we should be helping provide benefits for them. At the same time, the restaurant industry is one of the slimmest margins of all industries. And so there's a real tension between how do I, because there's no such thing as a sustainable restaurant that isn't open, right? Like if that restaurant closes, there's no jobs, there's no farmers, right? Like everything that they support with that business goes away, right? I know I feel like you're, okay, cue 
COVID <laughs> because you were at the James Beard Foundation. She was also, she was what we call our COVID fellows because she was a fellow and it was literally spring 2020. Yeah. You were doing all these events in person. And then I remember calling each fellow and say, we're going virtual in 24. So all of a sudden, all this advocacy that's happening work, like what impact did that have on all these aspects that we're talking about? Yeah, no, it was insane, right? So, I mean, COVID's still here and COVID still exists, but I will remember being, forever remember the very first conference call we tried to convene at the James Beard Foundation the week of March 9th. And this was pre-Zoom and pre the big things. And about 1,500 people tried to log on at the exact same thing. And we essentially crashed WebEx, right? Like, um, and that was the level of sort of urgency and panic. And you could see it almost because it started really in Seattle, right? Seattle and San Francisco, and it came and then New York, right? And But it was starting here and we started to watch it and it was like dominoes, right? And what we realized was that there was actually no lobby organization for small and independent restaurants in this country. Um, and so for decades, the restaurant industry as a whole had been largely dependent on the policies, advocacy, and lobbying of the National Restaurant Association, which I call the other NRA yeah. just because, <laughs> right? Um, and because they have a lot of similarities, right? And um, <laughs> they really do. <laughs> um, and I just got myself in trouble on a live stream, but that's okay. Um, right? Um, but, you know, so that was the only thing that existed. And this was an organization that had actively lobbied against Obamacare, actively lobbied against the minimum wage increases, actively lobbied against OSHA reforms to make, to help protect restaurant workers from a health and safety perspective. And we're not, when COVID hit, in really that interested or motivated in protecting the small operators. In the early days of COVID, all of the energy was like, how do we prop up the chains, right? How do we prop, prop up the all the big stuff? And listen, everybody wants jobs, food and security, like everybody's job is in some ways equal. But we just watched it. And so, you know, at the Beard Foundation and with Tom Clicchio and Kwame Anwache and Ashley Christensen is a chef in um, North Carolina and a bunch of other folks start and Andrew Zimmern create, started funding the Independent Restaurant Coalition. But this was important, too, because even if there was benefits coming through the administration, like they didn't necessarily always have these smaller businesses, the tools to figure out the regulations, the paperwork, all of that. Like they also needed advocates to help them figure that oh, out. No, a hundred percent. Like it was this really interesting time, right? Cause the administration at the time was trying to figure out like, how are we going to prop this up? Right? Like this was not the first global economy disaster that any U S president had faced. So like the economic advisors, everybody's trying to figure it out, but all of that money was going to go to industries right? It was going to go to the airline industry. It was going to go to the banking industry. It was going to go to the cruise ship industry because they had industry lobbyists sitting here in Washington being like, okay, we need a hundred million dollars, right? And there was no industry lobby that was looking out for this loose confederation of restaurants around the country. And they didn't really have leadership. And so what was amazing is what we saw was, you know, hundreds of alumni of the Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change, hundreds of folks who in their local community banded together. I mean, there was, um, and started these little like lobbying clusters, like what do we do, right? And there were chef and restaurateurs who for months were on phone calls and Zooms like two and three times a day. How do we get that? And, you know, they did all the things that people do when they get resources, right? They hired Stephanie Cutter, <laughs> right? Like they, um, they, they hired you know well-known lobbyists. They had access. To they had stuff. access. They could figure it out. I mean, within three phone calls, right? They could figure out who the lobbyist was within two phone calls. And the other thing was they did, which and I still have the spreadsheet. It's my favorite Google spreadsheet of all time. That says a lot about me. She has a lot of them too. I have a lot of them. Her too. favorite one. Um, so, is literally the state by state restaurant, city by city restaurant list, state by state, and they had gone in and mapped every single congressman, every single administration official, every single mayor who had ever come into any of their restaurants. 
and they put their cell phone numbers in there. They put their emails in there and they turned into the most relentless group of phone bankers you have ever seen. And, you know, it resulted in a bipartisan piece of legislation in both the House and the Senate. Earl Blumenauer was sort of one of the, and Shelley Pingree were big leads on the House side. Um, Senator Wicker is a Republican, right, was one of the lead sponsors on the Senate side. And they got their relief money. Was it enough? No. Was it flawed? Yes, right? But they got it. Right. And that was um, it was a story in community organizing. It was a story in mapping your networks and reaching out to them. It was a story in using a relentless, the same message relentlessly over and over and over again. And it was a sense of urgency. And it was also a sense of collective action. It's like one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Well, and, and that's one of the important parts when you talk about the nuts and bolts and the Power mapping and figuring this part out is the important part, right? Because um, it's also, you can't try to do everything. You have to figure out what you can do. You bring up an interesting point, though. There was Democrats, there was Republicans. You once said publicly that being a sign institute fellow was the best thing that ever happened to you in your life. Did I say that? <laughs> I might be paraphrasing. I'm looking at her husband in the front row going, I don't really think that's what I said. But um, that experience, uh, one of the things we talk about is collaboration. So was it hard to help? Like, is it hard when you're teaching people advocacy or how to use your voice? Is it hard to get over? But these are my personal feelings or I'm, you know, how do you not let the politics get in the way? Right. Because they also want to sell that, you know, governor, congressperson who's on the opposite aisle of them, their, you know, meal, but they also have to figure out their own personal politics. So how do you navigate that piece of it? Because, you know, that's one of the harder things to do, but what we really want to focus on at the Institute. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of, I always, I, do, I separate two pieces, right? I'm talking about policy, not partisanship. Right. And policy comes from compromise. It comes from conversation. Right. It comes from this endless sort of pursuit. Right. And over and it and it's never going to be perfect. Right. Like policy is something that we're always, always renegotiating. Right. We're always fighting for funding. Right. Right. So I think I, I totally break it down into like you're going to choose between partisanship and you're going to choose between policy advocacy and you're going to choose to be an advocate or you're going to choose to be an activist. Right. Um, and that is a hard, that second one is hard, right? Because I would consider myself a advocate for a good food system. And I would consider myself an activist when it comes to gender equity and ending violence against women in this world, right? And I am not a rational human being when I talk about the second, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, but when I talk about the first, when I talk about policy, like I can I can break that down and I can start to think about how I open up a conversation and how I do that. And so with chefs, and I really think it applies to all of us, right? We have to make sure that we know, are we are we being an activist, right? When, and there's something, activism is amazing. And I, I am an activist on a number of things. But like there is a certain element of when you turn, when you decide you're going to become an advocate, you are opening up your table, you are letting different people in, you are looking around you and figuring out, oh, who's the person that can help me do that? You're finding those unsuspecting or potentially like you didn't think about them allies, right? And, and it is a different mind, it's a mind shift, right? When you start to think about it and you know, I think chefs are more comfortable in the advocacy place because once they can make a decision about what is the issue that they're going to spend their time working on, the issue they're going to be educated about, the issue that they're going to find partners with, that kind of stuff, it, it takes the temperature, so to speak, down a little in the kitchen, right? And they can really focus on it and really hone in on it and develop a strategy for it. And they can care about all the aspects that is food policy, but focusing on a certain area matters because one, we've talked about the economics, we've talked about the, the processing and the regulations, we've talked about the workforce. Sometimes you have to take the business out of food. Culturally, there's policy around food, right? What are the cultural aspects of food that, you know, you've talked to, there was a lot of, um, you worked with a lot of chefs that, um, the the work in the indigenous communities mattered to them. And so how how do they use that voice, you know, in another aspect? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to the, the idea that, you know, you can do it in all of these ways, right? You can focus on flavor, you can focus on the, your community, you can focus on, you can focus on what's on the plate, you can focus on your community, you can focus on the policy. And I think there is a world of culture, right, that we've all become much more aware of, right, um, in terms of who owns our recipes, right, who can cook um, from an authentic place, right? Who can represent cultures in a meaningful and personal way? And, you know, food is one of these places. So like, this will be a tiny tangent. There is no intellectual property on it, recipes, right? So you create the best recipe, right? There's anybody can, you can tweak it by like an eighth of a teaspoon and you can republish you could republish that recipe, right? Because all of a sudden it's your recipe, right? So we have had recipes, we've had ingredients, we've had cultural descriptions literally stolen from people since we began the, since food, right? Um, and so we need to think about that when we're thinking about the, the impact that has. It doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean that I, as a home cook, can't cook, you know, spaghetti and meatballs. I'm not Italian, I'm Irish, American, right? Like I should only make stew. No, God help us. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, but it does mean, but it, then it also means that as people, as eaters, right, I think we have a certain level of responsibility to know who's cooking the food, what the ingredients are. And, and I love Sean Sherman. And I think this is where you're going, which is, you know, Sean Sherman's a chef that I had the opportunity to meet. He's a James Beard Award leadership winner. He's um, he's an amazing human. And I met him at a very naive and early stage of this work. And I was like, and he's from Pine Ridge Reservation in South, in South Dakota. That's where he grew up. That's where his family is. And I did work in South Dakota in 2002 and did voter protection on all of the reservation communities there, including Pine Ridge. And my aunt had actually been a VISTA volunteer on Pine Ridge. So I'm like, I'm finding my moment of connection with Sean, right? And I said something about like, it, it really was amazing to me that I, when I was doing all this voter registration and protection work on Pine Ridge, like I had to bring in my own food. Like I got to put my lunch and water in the car. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, and he's like, there's no grocery store on the reservation, right? There are corner stores and ad hoc places that people have created to feed and provide for their community, but there's no grocery store, right? And I was like, oh, right? Like pretty humbled in that like sort of naive thing of like, and then, but what is amazing about Sean is he's a tireless advocate for indigenous communities, indigenous ingredients. And so he just won the Beard Award for best new restaurant. I think his best new restaurant or best restaurant in the Midwest for his restaurant um, that literally sources both seasonally and only with the things that are made within the region and by indigenous communities. And it, it, so he does it on the plate and then he does it in policy and then he does it in his community. So it's pretty, he's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's, it was a fantastic part of the story and interesting to see because the food is so much a part of our own stories, right? And so how does that play out? And so for chefs, how do they also not, you know, bring that, they can bring that personal conversation in, yeah. into the, the dialogue. You did mention your advocacy work, um, certainly with women's rights, like what about gender equity? Like what, that's another big space that we see chefs weighing in on, um, making equity, you know, in, um, in the kitchen, whether it be, you know, making sure that they're healthy environments, but also, you know, for culturally and gender-based. So what, how do chefs sometimes use their voice in that? And, and at one point you said it begins at home. You can't, you can't not have a healthy environment and then go talk about that. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the biggest early criticisms or early questions about this work related that was both mine, but also other people's that were like, chefs shouldn't talk until they clean up their own kitchens. And I didn't quite know what that really meant until 2016, 2017, um, in the wake of Me Too, right? Um, and all the stories that then people felt both compelled and free to tell about what was happening in their kitchens and what was happening in their restaurants and what was happening in these places of hospitality, 
right? Um, and it was it was brutal to listen to and hear people talk about literally a male chef taking out his penis and putting it on a chopping block, you know, while a woman was to make fun of the woman across from him or right to hear how every time a, a woman walked by somebody like felt it was okay to grope her right or why while, while a, a gay man maitre d was harassed by other folks so it, it, it like those stories just came pouring out right um and then we started putting the data behind it right that there you know uh, restaurants writ large have a, a high level of female ownership because if you count things like um if you when you count chains and franchises right it's an entry point for many immigrant populations but when you look at who's owning a straight out owning and or leading kitchens the numbers like the cliff it just drops off right it's like any other industry and we were also seeing no capital being invested in women owners, right? We were seeing no training for entrepreneurship, all of those things, and which is crazy, right? It is an entry point for, you know, women in this country to work and own their own business. It's a community, but it was it was happening everywhere. But what was especially stunning for me was the double danger that women and others were facing in the kitchen from harassment, violence, alcoholism, like all the things. And so I think we've made strides, right? Um, like in all industries, but there's still a lot of work to do. And obviously the most important thing is to start talking about it, right? Yeah. So another area is mental health in the kitchen, right? Yeah. I mean, some people, there's been some shows, some dr drama sh series that kind of focus on that. But that's another issue, especially during COVID in these times, like it, we really started to be able to say we can talk about the mental pressures and, and you know, in the kitchen as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember, I mean, I didn't grow up in an era where we openly talked about addiction or mental health, right? Or going to our therapist or, right? Or the other night, somebody told me about their um, ketamine treatment, right? Like we don't, like I, that was not something that we really openly talk about. And it was, certainly was being hidden in the kitchen. And it's still probably hidden in a lot of kitchens, right? This um, feeling of, um, you know, pressure and vulnerability and addiction is high and violence is high. And it's a dangerous, like go walk through a, it, go walk through a kitchen at service time when hot oil, sharp knives, heavy pans are sort of being flung about and you will have a sense of like what it's like to work in that very closed environment. But mental health is one which the chef community really stepped up for. I think, you know, there was such a huge emotional response to the death by suicide of Tony Bourdain. Um, it really just kicked the industry in, in the teeth at the time when you know, it was reeling from Me Too. It was reeling from a, a number of other pieces. And then this person who seemingly had it all um, and was on vacation with one of his best friends, another chef who seems to have it all, and that he just chose to end his life. And it happened, the story is in the book, which is that at the same time, um, the city of Sacramento lost a handful of chefs and culinary folks to death by suicide roughly around the same time. And it it was just it took the wind out of such in such a way. But what's been amazing is that chef in Sacramento, a guy named Patrick Mulvaney, created a training train the trainer program related to mental health in the kitchen. And then Chris Shepard just recently, who's a chef from Houston, created another organization focused on mental health. So, you know, it's out there. They're talking about it, but it was all rooted in really extreme tragedy. Well, it. It makes Gracie's statement, it's a system even more important, right? Because I hope tonight you saw there's so many different layers that Catherine's bringing, you know, to this conversation, but we got to lighten this up. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. These are all really important issues, but I just have a curious question before we open up uh, to the audience. Your company, your handle is at table 81. Yes. What does that mean? Um, so table 81 is the back garden table at the Tabard Inn. Anybody know the Tabard? So if you walk through the door um, into, it's the first table on the right-hand side. And it is the table where I signed my first mortgage papers. 
It's the table where I probably spent way too many um, <laughs> um, afternoons. It's a place where solving the problems of the world. I'm yeah, sure solving the problems of the world. It's the place. It's a place where I saw. You know, it's the place where I signed my mortgage payment. It mortgage papers. It's the place where I got my accepted the offer to work at the UN Foundation, which is another job that changed my life. It's the job that. Um, it's the place. And so I always think of tables, right? And then I and I always think particularly of that one. So table eighty one. Um, there's also a table eighty one at my new favorite place called St. Vincent, which is a wine bar in Petworth, if anybody's there. Um, but uh, the bigger piece for me was that I think that advocacy, especially in this day and age, we need to bring as many people to the table for that conversation as possible, right? And so I just always want to use it as an opportunity to open up a dialogue with people. And my favorite thing to do with my husband and my favorite thing to do in general is invite random people over to our house and have dinner. Lou's always like, who are these people? Why are they coming over? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? And it's just because like such interesting things happen. Well, I think that's a good way to end our section, Catherine, but I know people are curious and this is not about the best restaurant guide and but like let's try to ask some questions about the the substance at hand but we'll go and matthew's going to help us with a with a microphone so you get to pick matthew oh, go over here to the green yeah they were up sorry phil they got a good question hi good afternoon oh good evening uh sorry i've been studying all day <laughs> <laughs> my name is roger reyes i'm an intercultural and international communications major with a focus on culture and public diplomacy um and i've been studying about guster diplomacy this week in my global perspectives and public diplomacy class um as somebody that mentioned that you have un experience what would a global food a diplomacy initiative for the state department look like um and in your opinion uh my question would be what would be the typical as an american my Myself, I have a hard time defining, but what would you define as being a typical American meal that we could definitely show there's the world? A lot, there's a oh, lot that's two pieces in, in there. there. Um, so, um, so let's take the easier one, which is um, <laughs> what does a gastro diplomacy program looks like? Well, I presume that's a plant because Johanna is like right next to you, who is the woman who literally invented gastro diplomacy in this country um, and globally. Um, but you know, at, at the James Beard Foundation, we created a program at the State Department that just recently relaunched, which was looking at the um, the power of chefs as soft power. Right. Um, if you take that lesson of like putting people around a table, teaching people about food, um, you can actually bring cultures together um, around that conversation. And, you know, that diplomacy initiative, it, you know, puts chefs into embassies where they can teach classes, where they can work with entrepreneurs, where they can promote products. Right. So it's really interesting. I, you know, I, I, think there's nothing better than um I just think there's nothing better than um in taking William Disson's a great example so William Disson's a chef from North Carolina and he is an amazing global ambassador and he um traveled to New Zealand uh pre-COVID um to work on sustainable seafood right and this whole thing and that required you know talking to the prime minister require talking to the embassy all those things and so i you know i think they can be forces for change because they can and globally within that food cuz again you can um you can experience it on the plate you can experience it in the community and you can experience it with um people of power i think the best american food cuz i'm just going to go there is is the food that makes you feel like home Right. And so I'm, you know, I grew up, I was born in Atlanta. I grew up in the panhandle of Florida and I went to college in New Orleans. So until the age of 21, I barely came above the Mason Dixon line. Right. Um, and there's nothing better for me than a, you know, warm tomato sandwich in summer. Not only, it's the only thing in my house that you can put even a tiny bit of mayonnaise on. Um, <laughs> you know, but I, and I think America is just so rich with, amazing food. I mean, we are a country of, um, whether it's our indigenous, original indigenous peoples, whether it's the people who, you know, are enslaved and brought here, like the, the food traditions are rich and amazing and they teach us history and politics and, and everything. So I think every, every person would answer that question differently. Yeah. 
I know, right? The pressure. Hello, I'm Phil, and you know me. Uh, <laughs> my question, and feel free to to phrase it in a different way if it's more helpful, but uh, school meals, are they part of the solution? Are they willing to be? Are they hamstrung? Is there any sign of hope there? Um, it's such a great question. So uh, no child should go through the entire day hungry, right? Nor should any child be shamed because they cannot afford to have lunch, right? Um, so I am a huge advocate and support organizations like No Kid Hungry and Common Threads and um, Wellness in Schools and all these folks that are really out there every day advocating for the expansion of school meal programs federally the, into all things like summer meals, right? Um, things like backpacks. It, you know, One of my earliest learnings in school meals was in the blizzards of New York, and no one could figure out why Bill de Blasio kept the school open. And he kept the school open because if he didn't keep the school open, millions of children were going to go hungry. Right. You no, know, Catherine, he told that story when he was here. As a Did he? About, yeah. Yeah. Because he was a, talking about education. And that was one of the biggest things. And it, yeah. and it, and it caused an. It was like insane. It just, People yeah. were like, you're keeping the schools open. You're like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, if we don't keep the schools open in New York, kids will starve. Right. And ha one, how do we live in a country? where if we close the school for two days, children will literally starve. Like, so let's start the conversation there. I am super excited about the work that's actually being funded by a philanthropist whose name is Trusk is his last name. I can't remember his first name out, um, but which is running ballot, state ballot initiatives on school, universal school meals. Because the big push now is during COVID, we had universal school meals in this country. Right. Um, and then all of a sudden we don't have the money to pay for it anymore. Or we don't have the political will to fight for it anymore. So Bradley, Bradley Trust is um, funding a series of state ballot initiatives. They just run the won the right to uh, universal school meals in Colorado, which they didn't think was going to happen. So, I, you know, I think everybody can I do think that everybody should get behind the idea that, you know, no kid should have to go through a whole day hungry. No kid should be shamed into not accepting being told that they have to go to the back of the line or have a different lunch because they can't afford something. And we have the, we have the money, we have the, um, and we just, we have a moral imperative to make sure that doesn't happen. I have a lot of opinions. <laughs> uh, my name is Katerina Nowicki. I was wondering, you touched a bit on the economics of food advocacy before, and I was wondering if you could talk more about um, how class and economic privilege impacts food advocacy, especially considering um, monetary privilege and how affording food that is healthy and affordable is a huge struggle in our country right now. No, absolutely. I mean, we every consumer makes an intersected makes an intersection decision based off price, convenience, and taste. Right. Um, and so that it changes based off where you sit in that continuum. But that that is the continuum we all make food choices on. And, you know, the fact that our farm bill, there's a little there's a little thing in the farm bill. It's called specialty crops. Specialty crops are fruit, fruit and vegetables. <laughs> right. Um, and when you look at the pie chart of the farm bill and you look at specialty crops, that sliver is very small. Right. So um, it, I, I love this man. Representative Jim McGovern is an amazing human. An AU alum. He's an eagle. Oh, he's an eagle. He's an eagle. He's an yep. eagle. And he, oh, that make that made, that makes, explains why, why he you. gave me the blurb for the book. Right. Um, but, um, but, you know, Jim McGovern says that, you know, hunger is a policy choice. Right. And I believe that too, about the fact that we have policies that have literally created food apartheid in this country, right? Where because you live he here in Washington, DC, if you live in wards one, two, and three, you have a Whole Foods, you have a Trader Joe's, you have a Harris Teeter, you have a union, you know, uh, you have a, a specialty market down the street. I live in ward five, right? Um, ward five has a big box, really not great <laughs> grocery store or a super high end, really not great organic store. That's the size of this room. Right. And those are essentially our choices, 
right? And so that is 100% a policy choice um, that we have made as a country. And until we prioritize food alongside of healthcare, alongside of climate change, it's not going to change, right? Um, and you know, I there's certainly food is certainly rife with privilege. It's certainly rife, like you know, and and we, but we also all make choices about the types of politicians that we support and the policies that we prioritize. So, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Johanna Mendelson Foreman, teach here at American University and I'm at Stimson Center. But the most important thing is I consider myself a friend of Catherine's. Uh, <laughs> what was the most uh, important thing you found in writing the book that you didn't really know when you started the project? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I, I think one thing I found is personal and one thing I found is professional. Um, I it, like writing a book is a really hard thing, <laughs> right? Um, staring at a blank page and hearing your, um, you know, your publisher in your head going, your book is overdue, your book is overdue, right? Um, it, all of that was really hard. And I said, like, there's some personal strength that I found in there that I didn't actually realize I had. The professional thing and the food thing that I found was I had started, I didn't, I hadn't put it all together. Right. I hadn't put all these stories together where they made sense in a way that was like, oh, this is actually a thing. Right. Like this is a thing that people have put into practice time and time again. Right. Um, and it is something also that organizations are thinking about more and more is about how to utilize chefs and culinary professionals in their own advocacy, their own organization advocacy. So like that was the biggest aha was just like, you know, I think about it as all of those little puzzle pieces, right? And you're like, oh yeah, this thing happened and this thing happened and this thing happened and this thing happened. And then you like, you're like, oh, right? Like this actually works, <laughs> right? So, um, and then I think the one food thing I, um, I, I didn't know about this, and um, I think it is since closed or it's not as prevalent, but there's also a move within the restaurant industry around differently abled accessibility. And so in the research for some of the pieces, um, I found a whole group of restaurants, um, one who was started by um, a deaf entrepreneur and employs predominantly deaf folks and like those types of accessibilities in the kitchen were just a little bit of a revelation for me. Like, and it feels obvious, but, um, but it was, that was, that was a piece of research that I was like, oh, wow. Like we're taking this to a different level. Right. Okay. We have time for one more and I'm not going to pick. So I'm going to make Matthew do it. One more. How about here right behind this? <laughs> Ed, you can ask your question outside after. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Lori Watkins here, uh, founder of the Cooks Collective, I know, uh, which is a men focus on mental health. But my question is tying into that is, can you talk to everybody about the, through advocacy work, the emotional, the personal gratitude and gratification and empowerment that when you train these cooks and chefs, that that brought to them? Because... For me, advocacy helps my mental health. It helps me feel good. I feel like I am part of a purpose and a mission. If you could talk about that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. No, absolutely. I, I do think it gave a, a lot of people a, a renewed sense of purpose, right? Because the world feels really, right? Um, can I say that on a live stream? It's really, really screwed messed up. up. It's really yeah, messed, messed up, up. It's right? Messed um, up, so up. the world's really messed up, right? And it feels intractable and it feels like, what my, what is my little thing going to do, right? Um, and that creates this like burden on all of us, right? Like sometimes don't, don't sometimes you just want to crawl into bed and pull the covers over your head, right? Because how can I do something for this, right? And so the training aspect gives you the tools, to to do it to break it into something that is digestible let's go to a food word right um and then it by doing that then you feel this sense of like accomplishment right
right? Because I think the other thing is like, we all don't, we all don't have the power to personally save the world, right? Like as much as we want to, it's going to happen collectively. Sorry, Jen. Right. Um, right. Like it's, it's the onus, like we take it on and especially people who work in nonprofits and people who work in these fields, like we're like, oh my God, like I, like I, we're going to save it. We're going to save it. And it's like, no, no, no. Like I need every single person in this room in order to move the needle this much further. Right. And so I think one, it really is like a great sort of dopamine hit to like get involved in a cause and do the thing and get that positive affirmation. It's also great to find your people in your community who help you keep moving that forward and um, can be there to support you. It's also a hundred percent okay to tag out. <laughs> right? Because there's someone next to you who can help you. And it's okay to be like, you know what, I got to, I got to take a break for a little while. Right. Um, and so like, I, I think advocacy is when we learn to prioritize the thing that means the most for us, we get the skills and the tools in order to be able to do that in a meaningful way. Um, and we have a community of people and a community of practice around us to lift us up and support us in that. Um, is is actually one of the most powerful and beautiful things. And it does, it gives me hope every day. And I know it does for the chefs that do this work. They tell me all the time, right? That like, this is the thing that gives them something different to look forward to outside of the kitchen, right? I think that's an incredible way to And Catherine, thank you so much for yeah, your thank you. today. I want to um, thank you for your continued support of SIGN. We um, have refreshments for and people can come and, and break some bread and further the conversation. We want you to meet, you know, other people that are here. We have books still available to buy students, get a book from sign. And I think you're going to sign some yeah, people happy as well. Yeah, and and um, certainly can ask questions and whatnot, but we all welcome you to stay for us with a little bit and have something to eat. And then Ted, you can ask your question outside. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and may I just say real quick, I want to thank the sign Institute team. A lot of work goes into putting. Yes events together. I always say it's like Thanksgiving dinner. It's like weeks and weeks ahead of time and it's over in an hour. So I just want to, if you're the sign team, raise your hand and wave a little and say, give thank the you sign team a round. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody. Let's, let's thank you. the conversation.